Jellyfish Research in South Africa is quite young. It's about five to six years old um, when it comes to the husbandry or growing out the animals. We are mostly just working on the genetics because we needed to determine that the animals on the South African coast is actually very really different to all the other jellyfish in the world. Each jellyfish has different environmental parameters and because of that we need to understand which environment the animal grows in and what the animal is dependent on in its environment for us to successfully grow them from a polyp to a jelly and to keep that jelly alive for as long as possible. That's why I like having Maori and Luigi over there because they constantly remind me that you can't look at something from a narrow perspective. In things like games you have to have a broad understanding of what's happening in the game environment. Without having all the information or all the weapons, um, you won't be able to complete the boss because you don't have the tools required or the knowledge required in order to execute and win the battle that lays ahead of you. They're here to be studied and they're also here to teach the public about jellyfish themselves because we are a teaching aquarium and we want people to learn more about the ocean. So, proof of concept. The young man is in the genre of a young man going to lecture. We're going to learn from him. And we so look forward. Thank you, Thank you Chris Lewis. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to try and explain how jellyfish can fit into ocean conservation. So jellies are animals that technically swim around and eat all the time. And they've got the perfect diet body. The more they eat, the bigger they grow, and if they don't eat at all, they just basically shrink down. Jellies are also considered the problem because they sting people when you go swimming. Um, they sting the fish in fish farms, and also they get sucked into cooling intake systems like Kuberg and shut them down for a long period of time. But I'll explain to you in a second um, that even if you take all the jellies out of the ocean, that's not going to solve anything because the animals that actually make the jellyfish are called polyps, and they're tiny animals at the bottom of the ocean floor somewhere. So how do jellies work? Generally, if you have two jellyfish, most of the time for most animals, two jellies don't make more baby jellies. Jellies actually make polyps, and those are the guys, if you look on the left-hand side, um, they are super tiny, about two of them fit in the tip of your pencil. And you can think of a jellyfish's life cycle like that of a butterfly's. So they have the same kind of link-ups and eventually end up with a jellyfish. And so one of the old methods that we used to use in order to get these polyps um, is actually to blend two jellyfish together, back in old science. Um, but now, if you just catch them and keep them in a bucket, anytime they're stressed, they release these, these lava that make more polyps. So catching jellyfish for food, or actually just moving them around, stresses them and makes more polyps. So polyps can stick to anything that's hard. So a harbor wall, a rock in the ocean, or even a pen to grow fish out. And jellyfish clone themselves, or polyps clone themselves. So in theory, if you have one polyp, and it clones himself 99 times, and you have 100 polyps in the end, the polyp is technically the same animal, and that's why we consider them to be immortal. Because if 99 of them die, and the same one that's left is the same animal, it's basically never gonna die. Um, a few guys in America also studied a polyp for a couple of years. They took off food, they made the temperature really hot, and what happens is the polyp forms a scar like you have a scar when you get hurt, and after a couple of years, they chucked food back into the water, the polyp grew back, and basically made more polyps to make more jellies. And if you warm the water or cool the water, the polyps make baby jellyfish. And that's just basically three examples. There's about 25 different ways a polyp can clone itself. But most of the time, they split into two. They make a little root and pop up new guys. Or they just bud off one from the side. And the picture over here at the bottom is a picture of a colony of polyps um, that was grown in a month by just feeding them all the time. One of the problems that we actually face in the ocean is ballast water. Um, that is because animals from one region of the ocean is taken to another region. And normally the animals that are native in that region can't compete with the new alien species. And so those alien species tend to outcompete the animals that already lived there originally. And so the Black Sea is a very good example of this. On my right hand side at the bottom, I've got a picture of ballast water. So when you order your new PlayStation or something, most of the time um, a cargo ship picks it up in one part of the world and basically 80% of our things are traveled or moved around by the ocean. And so when the ship reaches its destination to either put on new goods or take off old goods, it releases the water from the previous harbor it took off. And so in the Black Sea, um, what happened was the walnut jellyfish was taken from America in ballast water and released into the Black Sea. 
And the walnut jellyfish is pretty fantastic in the sense that it only eats baby fish. And so for that short period of time, it ate all the baby fish in the Black Sea. And so there weren't enough adult fish in order to make new fish. And so we had fisheries collapse. That's when you try and catch fish and you don't find anything. And also by a fluke, a few years later, with the Black Sea not having fish, another cargo ship came around and it brought the natural predator of um, the walnut jellyfish, which is the Barui. And the Barui perfectly ate up all the walnut jellyfish and Barui only eat Barui. So once all the walnut jellies were gone, they basically died. And so that was a complete fluke in fixing a problem. Another example we have is, in the wild, we have natural cycles of jellyfish. So most seasons, especially in South Africa at the end of summer, we have big jellyfish blooms, but as soon as summer is over and the water gets cold, the jellyfish disappear again. So South Korea also has that situation happening, but remember I told you guys we used to blend jellyfish to make um, more polyps? Because they have a problem with moon jellyfish and Namura jellyfish, um, and they wanted to solve the problem now, they decided to make robots. Um, they floated around in the ocean and blend up jellyfish. So exponentially, they increased every single year because there's more and more polyps. They just made the problem worse and worse and worse. And what they didn't think of, they were just thinking of themselves, but the ocean connects Japan and China. And so that same jellyfish problem spread to Japan and China. And so it became a domino effect and it affected everybody on that side. We bring it back home, the Benguela. Um, back in the 1970s when most of us were not born, anybody with a fishing vessel could go and catch fish. So we're talking about hake, sardines, and pilchards, especially um, off Namibia itself. And so because the Benguela is such a, a rich ecosystem of food supporting seals and, and penguins that actually eat these hake and sardines, um, when they took all this fish out and all the food was left, um, coincidentally, jellyfish eat the same food that the fish eat. So the jellies could come in, fill that niche that the fish left when they were gone, and so the jellies reproduced exponentially. So at the moment, for every 3.8 million tons of hake, sardines, and pilchard combined, up until this day, we've about 13.8 million tons of campus jellyfish all year round in Namibia. Um, and here's a video over here I can show you. Um, this was from March, and this is a trawl that they tried to catch fish, and they caught seven tons of jellyfish and one snook instead. Um, <laughs> So this is a very, very big problem. Um, but in the bottom corner over here, if I can show you, we occur um, in the southern Benguela. And our fisheries were watching what Namibia was doing, and we were like, no, 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 we're not going to let that happen over here. And so near the same time period, after the 1970s, our fisheries management got their act together, and we put laws in place for how much fish you can take out of the environment. And so in that way, we kept healthy fish stocks of sardine, pilchards, and hake, the same kind of animals that occur in northern Meguela. We also have the same jellyfish occurring off our coast, but because our ecosystem was kept in check, the jellies only bloom in summer and then disappear. Um, and so that is an, our example is an example of a healthy ecosystem, and the northern Benguela is an example of an overfish ecosystem where these animals don't coexist like they're naturally supposed to. So what have we learned? We have learned that jellyfish are excellent indicator species for when things go a bit whack and wrong. Um, from our first example, we learned that we need to try and manage um, ballast water because invasive species are brought in, and when the one jellyfish ate so many fish as larvae or babies, um, it brought down the biodiversity of the ocean completely, and so we need to find a way of fixing and conserving the animals that we have. Um, we learned over there from our example from um, South Korea is that we should just let natural cycles go like they're supposed to. They will eddy, they will come and go like, like you should, and we should never think that us solving our problem is only located or kept to us. There's always other things that are always connected. And like you saw, them trying to fix what they thought was their problem actually affected everybody else. And then lastly, we saw that um, with proper fisheries management, we can actually have a natural ecosystem where all the animals can coexist and nothing really goes wrong, so to say. Thank you. I especially like the bit where, where he said that all, most of us were not born by 1970. <laughs> uh, we'd like to hear, are there any questions that's coming from the audience? There's a question, please. What's not clear to me is why we need jellyfish. I mean, in other words, if we wiped out every jellyfish on Earth, would it make any difference to uh, the balance of our, you know, our ecosystems and our, 
Uh, I mean, why are, what's the use of a jellyfish? That's not clear to me. Okay, so especially in the Benguela, because there are so many jellyfish, they could do studies there and in a few other locations in the ocean, jellyfish are actually very good at closing the nutrient cycle. So there's something called marine snow, and then also because jellyfish eat everything up in the top water column once they die, and they sink to the bottom, they return the nutrients back to the bottom again. And especially in an area like the Benguela, where all the, the muck and the dirtiness is pulled up for nutrients for the, for the phytoplankton to make new food, um, jellyfish is very good at keeping that nutrients in that system and helping it to cycle from the bottom back to the surface and then back down again. So they, they close that link in the nutrient cycle.